Um, thanks everyone for, for coming and joining us, really appreciate it. Uh, my name is Simon. Um, I founded, uh, alongside a few others, a business called The Forge uh, back in 2013. We're a sort of marketing consultancy, so um, using insight to solve uh, marketing challenges. Um, and as you know, what I really want to talk about today is, is reframing our narrative around, around buying new. Um, and I'm going to start just by, unfortunately, with a little few, with a few figures, if that's all right. Um, if you haven't downloaded it, please download the Purpose Disruptors Advertising Emissions Report. It's brilliant, brilliant and very provocative read. But one of the things in there that I found really interesting was the UN uh, Environmental um, Programme says the United States are the top 10 percent of consumers. That's 700 many, million people globally who emit nearly half of the world's carbon pollution need to cut our footprints, carbon footprints by 90 percent. The, the European Environment Policy, the Institute for Euro European Environment Policy went even further and they said the world's 1% richest needs to reduce their carbon footprint by 97%. So which obviously leads to the question, am I in that top 10 or even top 1%? Well, probably chances are you are. Um, so according to givingwhatwecan.org, which is part of the kind of whole uh, effective altruism group of people, if you're in the UK and you earn over £13,300, you are in the top 10 global. If you earn over 45,000 in the UK, you are in the top one global. So that is just the reality. Now, there are so many things that we need to do to drive that consumption down, that footprint down. And I know we're all deeply passionate about loads and loads of those things. But the thing I in particular want to talk about is the role of buying new and, and how that changing that narrative around secondary re-commerce, so secondary selling, secondary buying, usership versus ownership, how changing that narrative can help reduce that consumption level. Before I do that, let, let me start a little bit with a story. So um, back in sort of December uh, 2019, uh, I was sat uh, just next door actually at home and the doorbell went uh, and I went to the door to go and find a courier there handing me an Amazon little brown parcel and I suddenly realized I had absolutely no idea what this was. That actually just the day before I'd ordered something and yet a day later, I couldn't remember what it was. I've been seduced by that little blue button of convenience. I've become almost the dictionary definition of, of, uh, of unthinking autopilot behavior. I had just gone, want, so what, think, want, buy, get, bang, done, in it came. And, I, and I'd just forgotten, I didn't even know what it was. And I had a bit of a moment of reflection thinking, I'm not sure that's great. I think I might wanna change that behavior. So I set myself a challenge that in 2020, I would go a whole year without buying anything new. Um, now, I think it's really important that first of all, I say look, I'm immensely privileged that I am in a place where that is a choice and not a necessity. You know, I'm the first one to realize that there are millions and millions of people who don't have that choice. I do. I'm very lucky. But as we've also seen, it's that top 10 percent, that top one percent who need to cut our carbon footprint by the most. And I'm very fortunate to be in that top 10 percent. And therefore, that's why this is of such importance to me to think about why do we do this now? I, I nearly managed it. Uh, I failed twice. I bought a new pair of running trainers. And I bought a new paddle for my paddleboard. It turns out I'm human and fallible, which is always a good thing to be reminded of. But three years later, this is how I operate. This is my mindset. On everything, my start point is, can I get this secondhand? Now, I don't always succeed with that. There are some things you can't get, and some things are difficult, and some things I failed on. But it is my default. It is how I start. It's how I approach everything now. And what's really interesting is that for me, it's been life changing. Yet when I tell this story to people, there are two questions I'm always asked. The first question without fail is, what did you miss? The second question usually without fail is, what did you go out and buy on the 1st of January 2020? And, and those two questions might seem perfectly reasonable. But the problem is that they actually, in my view, perfectly encapsulate the, the problem. And that's that there is this an incorrect base assumption that buying second hand is somehow a compromise. And I think nothing could be further from the truth. And there is an assumption of negatives, which I think is so wrong because actually it's a story of discovered positives. Discovered positives, like gaining a real sense of reward when actually I've had to work a little bit harder to find what I really want and I really need. 
the positive of realizing what actually makes me happy versus what I thought made me happy. The positive of this, this bargain hunter payoff, and I'll show you an advert in a second from eBay, which in my mind perfectly articulates this. So yes, it's saving a lot of money, but it's more than just the money saving. It's about an identity. It's about a set of values. It's about the emotional payoff to me as an individual. It's about the fact that I've, as exactly as, as Rebecca said, keeping money in the local community. But if I'm buying from peer to peer, I'm giving money to somebody directly who wants it or could use it. Or if I'm buying from a charity, that I'm giving that money to the charity. It's not going to you know, a big corporation and shareholder dividends. It's actually going to people where I think the money is probably more worthwhile and valued. I'm saving products from landfill. I'm not contributing to a carbon footprint that is created every time a new product gets bought. And then finally, a really important thing for me is the fact that my kids who are 13 and 11, this is just completely normal. They have no stigma about this. This is just absolutely how they see life and they think it's a good thing. So loads and loads of positives. But I think this incorrect assumption about negatives is that there is an inherent compromise is deeply problematic for two reasons. The, the first one is that it immediately positions buying secondhand or borrowing or not buying new as lesser as something you have to do rather than something you choose to do, as some sort of inherent compromise. And that flaw nature to it. And then secondly, I think it perpetuates a belief that our default behavior is and should be to buy new. And that perpetuates a use and dispose kind of culture. So, so why am I here? Well, the unfortunate truth is that as marketeers, we are complicit in this obsession with new. We, we understand what motivates us to want more. We press the buttons that we know will cause irrational desire because in reality, that's quite often what it is. It's irrational. We don't necessarily need more. We want more. We think we need more. And, and I want to change that narrative. I want to reframe the conversation from an assumed negative to a, to a discovered positive. I want to create a world in which other forms of ownership, usership, are more aspirational than buying new. So secondary buying, secondary selling, usership versus ownership, all become integral to, to, a, to a more sustainable way of living. But the reality is that unfortunately there are loads of stigmas, right? So there are stigmas from businesses, this belief that we need to buy new because if we don't buy new, if we buy secondhand, that's a lost new sale and that one cancels out the other. Don't think that's true. Secondly, that there's a stigma from consumers, because if new equals status, then does secondhand equal lesser status? And then a stigma from customers as well, which is the reality is our systems are set up for new. That's how businesses make money. And this idea that they have to reconfigure their systems to sell secondhand, very challenging. But it doesn't have to be the way. There are thousands of businesses out there, and Rebecca is absolutely one of those that have proven this just is not the way it has to be. This is not an immutable law. We can absolutely change that narrative. And, and I want to do that. So, so my vision is, is a creative commons approach, a, an open source library of shared knowledge about how businesses can start to change that. And I really see that as four people coming together. The first one is business consultants who can prove the model of secondary buying. Because actually, in my view, I think secondary buying is actually the purest form of capitalism. If you can take a single investment in COGS and monetize that multiple times, surely that's, you know, would make Maynard Keynes and his acolytes kind of cheer in delight. Like this is, this is the perfect way to do this. As insight professionals, what are the triggers? What are the barriers to changing those, to, to that change in behavior? How do we overcome them? What do we need to do? As marketing professionals, what are the interventions that we can make across the marketing mix to change that narrative to make it more aspirational and then finally as advertisers what is the communication that we can do to drive that change at scale and if you'll allow me i just want to share an advert with you all which you might have seen from ebay which i think hopefully you can all see my screen thumbs up can you see it okay great i'm just going to play this and just and just watch it bargain hunters such a reductive title this is an Light entertainment. This is a sport. It's the apex predators. Research. Sure, he may look like he's just having a latte, but now it's time to strike. 
finding the perfect thing at the perfect price. That's the eBay way. And I, I, I love that. Oh. Sorry. There we go. There we go. <laughs> I, I love that because what it so, so perfectly articulates for me is these discovered positives. That it's more than just saving money. It's about who you are, the identity, those big emotional payoffs that make a thing aspirational. Saving money, yeah, good, but it's rational. Being a being a person who is a bargain hunter, it's an emotional, it's a bigger thing to kind of do. So I I'm I'm basically done, but I want to leave you with three questions that I would love for you to think about in the in the remainder of our time together. The first one is what are the barriers? to secondary buying and selling that we think exist? What is stopping us? What are the stigmas that exist? Why do they exist? Secondly, what are the triggers? What are the potential things that we could do, messages that could overcome those, those, those barriers? How will we reframe this conversation in a positive light? And thirdly, who's doing it well? What examples have you seen? I've talked about wanting to bring together people who, who share this view and that share this mission to create this creative commons who should we be talking to? Brands, advertisers, advertisements, even little marketing interventions. Who are you out there seeing who's doing this well? So that is everything that I wanted to share. Hopefully that's um, prompted a few thoughts. <laughs>